Do you find glomerular disease difficult? Do you find glomerulonephritis difficult? Most people do. Seems small, tiny. But glomerulonephritis follows these principles. Glomerulonephritis, no matter what the cause is, all forms of glomerulonephritis give red blood cells in the urine. All forms of glomerulonephritis give red blood cell casts in the urine. All forms of glomerulonephritis gives you protein in the urine. All forms of glomerulonephritis, if it becomes really severe, can cause nephrotic syndrome. All forms of glomerulonephritis are most accurately diagnosed by biopsy. In other words, ultimately, if you don't get the diagnosis another way, you diagnose it with biopsy. That seems kind of easy, don't you think? should start out with that. What do they all have in common? What do they all have in common? In other words, if you have a per person and they got, oh, periorbital edema, well, periorbital edema, there's nothing really specific about periorbital edema. Oh, but then they put in a question, two weeks, one to two weeks post throat infection. Oh, now you want me to know the answer, don't you? Because you just told me something. Because if you want me to know the answer, you have to be told something. It's not like our relationships where people ask you how you're doing and you go, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh, I know that kind of fine. That's the kind of fine where you're going to kill me. Yes. See, the boards are not like that. Your test is not like that. If they want you to know that it is post-infectious glomerulonephritis, if they want you to know that it's post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, they have to tell you something. They have to tell you that there's an anti-streptolysin O, an anti-DNAs, an anti-hyaluronidase, periorbital edema, two weeks post-throat infection. Because just saying hypertension and edema is not enough because this is the nephrology section and everything in the nephrology section causes hypertension and edema. Everything in the nephrology section causes hypertension and edema. So that will not give you the answer. If they want you to know the answer, they have to tell you something. Well, Conrad, Conrad, fishy, fishy, fishy. You said that the most accurate test for post, all, everything glomerular is a biopsy, but nobody biopsies post-streptococcal. Well, there's the difference between the question that says, what would you do and what is the most accurate? What would you do in this patient? I wouldn't biopsy. What is the most accurate a biopsy? What would you do? I'm not doing a biopsy. What is the most accurate? Not a biopsy. So there's a huge difference now, isn't there? Yes, there is. There's a huge difference. What would I do? I don't biopsy because I have these other nice blood tests that give me the diagnosis. You see, it's kind of like a person who has, let's see, what if they, I told you that they had GI problems, joint pain, skin, purple ass, purple ass child, GI joint, skin and renal, GI joint, skin and renal, GI joint, skin and renal, GI joint, skin and renal. What if I tell you that? <gasps> then you know, that's how you know it's Hanok Schonlein purpura. So I don't have to biopsy Hanok Schonlein purpura because I have unique physical finding pattern, abdominal pain, GI pain, GI bleeding, joint pain, and purpuric raised palpable purpuric skin lesions, a mabute, look for a kid with a purple ass, I have a unique pattern. Also, since there's no specific therapy and it resolves spontaneously, why am I going to biopsy little Johnny for a disorder that's gonna get better in 98% of the patients? And the answer is only if the diagnosis is not clear. So post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis and Hinox Schonlein purpura have something in common. What is the most accurate test? Biopsy. 
What would I do? No biopsy. One, because I have blood tests. ASLO, anti-DNase, anti-hyaluronidase. The other, because I have a relatively unique symptom pattern. And the most important thing is because these both resolve on their own in almost every patient. Now, I could ask you hypothetically, I say, could they cause nephrotic syndrome? Yes, they could cause nephrotic syndrome. So 2% and 1% can go on to nephrotic? Yes, 1% can go on to nephrotic, 2% go on to nephrotic. But that's a different than saying the expected outcome is resolution. Why biopsy people if they're gonna resolve? So what we do for post-streptococcal is we can use diuretics for the hypertension and edema, diuretics for the hypertension and edema, and antibiotics, and that's, there's the paradox of saying what works, nothing works. It gets better on its own. What do we do? We give antibiotics. <laughs> what does it do? Nothing. He knocks online purple, gets better on its own. What do we do? Nothing. Oh, what happens when it says it progresses and the renal failure gets worse? It's progressing and the renal failure is worse. What do we do? And then the answer becomes ACE inhibitors and steroids because we don't know what else to do, so we try something. We don't know what else to do, so we try. Clear? Unique pattern, no treatment, no biopsy. Progresses, ACE inhibitors and steroids. Most common wrong answer, saying an IgA level. IgA levels don't help. Speaking of IgA, what about IgA nephropathy? IgA nephropathy, also known as Berger's disease, or Berger's disease, Berger. Well, IgA nephropathy used to be called recurrent benign hematuria used to be called benign recurrent hematuria. But it's not so benign, is it, when one-third of patients end up on dialysis. That's not too benign. You can't call it benign recurrent hematuria. So IgA nephropathy has to be biopsied. You gotta biopsy it. You have to biopsy it because of two reasons. Number one, there is no blood tests. There's no blood test. There's no blood test for it, and IgA levels don't help. Number two, there is zero physical findings that will tell you that you have IgA nephropathy, zero. Number three, it's serious. It's not some benign, self-limited, self-resolving thing. You're gonna end up on dialysis in one third of patients. It's got no blood test. There's no physical findings. Oh, post-streptococcal, I got blood tests. DNA, hyaluronidase, anti-streptolysino, or made my diagnosis. Hey, Dr. Schoenlein, Purper, I got physical findings that can tell me. And the other one is, you're going to be on dialysis one-third of the time. IgA nephropathy. So there is, again, no paradox. There's a paradox, excuse me, no treatment that reverses it. Yet, if it continue, as it continues to progress, we use ACE inhibitors and steroids and fish oil, and it gives us something to do while we watch it. Okay, it gives us something to do while we watch it progress. What reverses it? Nothing. And the last thing, if they want you to know the answer, there's only one thing in the history where they may tell you that it's at the same time as a viral upper respiratory infections, as a viral upper respiratory, it may be within one or two days, same time. Post-streptococcal is post-infection, one or two weeks, post-infection, one or two weeks, and IgA is at the same time as a viral upper respiratory infection. Now, all forms of vasculitis, like Churg-Strauss syndrome. Churg-Strauss syndrome is a vasculitis, allergic angiitis, Wegener's granulomatosis, Wegener's granulomatosis, Churg-Strauss syndrome, microscopic polyangiitis, polyarteritis nodosa, all forms of vasculitis. All forms of vasculitis. 
can cause renal failure, glomerulonephritis. All forms of vasculitis cause fever and weight loss. All forms of vasculitis can give you a normocytic, normochromic anemia of chronic disease. All forms of vasculitis. I break down my blood vessels and I have GI bleeding. I break down my blood vessels in my brain and I have stroke into my brain. I have stroke into my brain and GI and I have K okay, and I have skin lesions because I have blood vessels that are damaged in my skin. Petechiae purpura, petechiae purpura. And what's the difference between the petechias and a purpura? Size. Right now I'm just a little petechia, but someday I'll grow up and be a big purpura. Skin, bra, the eye problems, iritis, uveitis, because most of the blood vessels in the eye come right out into the iris, the uveal tract. Now, vasculitis is so hard and so difficult that we're here, but here and in the rheumatology section, but they follow principles. Blood vessels cause joint pain, inflammation, burst and damage my brain, my GI tract, my skin, my bowels, my kidneys. So what's different? They all cause mononeuritis multiplex because it damages the vasonervorum. The vasonervorum. The blood vessels around the nerves. The vasonervorum. But what's different about these? Churg Strauss is the only one that gives eosinophils and asthma because it's allergic angiitis. Wegener's granulomatosis gives upper respiratory findings. Sinusitis, otitis, sinusitis and otitis. Polyideritis sedosa tends to skip the lung and also is most frequently inside the GI tract and is the one that's most frequently associated with hepatitis B and C. What's different and unique? What's different and unique? Now, if they don't give you the answer, if they don't tell you it's associated with hepatitis B and C, if they don't tell you it's skipped the lung, you have no way of knowing. Cause all these vasculitides, all of these, and all of these vasculitides all have a very similar presentation. I'm tired, I'm inflamed, I have an anemia of chronic disease, I've got joint pain from my chronic inflammation, I've got eye problems like iritis and uveitis, I've got mononeuritis multiplex. What's different? Another little thing of what's different. Oh, P. anca, also known as antimyeloperoxidase. P. anca and antimyeloperoxidase. C. anca for Wegener's granulomatosis also known as antiproteinase 3. No blood test really is good for polyarteritis sedosa. Ultimately, the most accurate test for all of them is a biopsy. And the good news is all of them get treated with the same thing. Steroids and cyclophosphamide. So steroids and cyclo, steroids and cyclophosphamide. Stero steroids, steroids, and cyclophosphamide. Okay. Ultimately, they get the same treatment. So I have a couple little things extra for you here. For polyarteritis sedosa, since we really don't like biopsying kidneys, there's something that you can do to make the diagnosis of polyarteritis sedosa less invasively. Because it involves the GI tract and abdominal pain and GI bleeding so much, you can do a GI angiogram. Do a mesenteric angiogram, mesenteric gastrointestinal vessels angiogram. And that GI mesenteric vessel angiogram can help spare you the kidney biopsy. Just having hepatitis B and C is not enough because lots of people have hepatitis B and C. Second, you could, instead of having to biopsy the kidney, you can biopsy the cerebral nerve. Where is your cerebral nerve? You ever wondered? Where is it? You know, most people don't know where it is. 
Where is your sural nerve? Hmm. Well, I'm going to tell you that if you knew where it was, we wouldn't let you biopsy it because you'd need it. Your sural nerve is down below in your leg by your gastrocnemius. Most people don't know. Eight out of 10 medical students don't know what the sural nerve is because it's not essential. You can give it up. The sural nerve. Now, if you knew where it was, like if I said to you, uh, we're gonna biopsy your penis, or we're gonna biopsy your eyeball, you'd be like, no you're not, I know what that is. We can biopsy it because we don't need it. Where is it? I don't know. Let's get rid of it. You don't need it. They all get steroids and cyclophosphamide. Oh, here's, let's get one that you're gonna always get right. Congenital eye and ear. Uh, congenital eye, ear, collagen. Congenital eye, ear, collagen. This is one of the most frequently correctly answered questions. Congenital eye, ear, collagen. Eye displaced len lens, ear, sensory neural hearing loss. Eye, ear, collagen, eye, ear. Congenital eye, ear, collagen. Alports, alports. You'd think the whole world was filled with alports. That's one of the most frequently correctly answered questions. People seem to all know this. What's two plus two? Oh, no. What's Alport syndrome? It's a congenital disorder, type four collagen, leading to displacements of the lens of the eye, as well as sensory neural hearing loss in congenital families, and there's no treatment. <laughs> People tend to know it. Why, why, why? Well, if we looked at lupus, lupus nephritis, we know that 95 to 99% of people with lupus have an ANA. 60% of people have a double-stranded DNA. Well, you have a unique physical findings of a malar rash. You have other findings that even if you never biopsy the kidney, you would know it was lupus. Your ANA is positive, your double-stranded DNA is positive in, in two-thirds of patients. Malar rash, discoid lupus. Kidney problems, but you also have hematologic problems. It's lupus. There's not the diagnosis of lupus is not monosymptomatic. By definition, it can't be lupus if it's only your kidneys. By definition, you have four, four, four things to have lupus. So by definition, no one can present and be called lupus nephritis with just kidney problems. So why do you have to biopsy everybody? So you have to biopsy everybody. Well, I don't understand. Kidney biopsy. We don't like kidney biopsies. You can't tamponade a kidney biopsy. If you bleed, you can't press on it. I could cut your aorta, and if I can put a finger on it, I can save you. I can cut your carotid, and if we can compress it, we can save you. But you can't compress things that are underneath your ribs, that are retroperitoneal structures. How are you going to compress it? People bleed from kidney biopsies. You have to biopsy the kidney because in lupus nephritis, that's the only way you can know. Can you be treated with steroids alone? Do you need to have cyclophosphamide? Do you need to have cyclophosphamide? Do you need both? No one is going to get cyclophosphamide, which is an alkylating agent, which is chemotherapy. No one is going to get cyclophosphamide, which is chemotherapy, without a kidney biopsy, without a tissue diagnosis. No one is going to get chemotherapy without a tissue diagnosis. And even though this is chemotherapy, it's also immunosuppressive, that's why you have to have a biopsy. You're not biopsying to tell me whether you have lupus nephritis. You're biopsying it to tell me the severity. That's why you're biopsying it. Tell. Response to therapy. Now, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, the only other one left, hemolytic uremic syndrome and TTP. 
hemolytic uremic syndrome and TTP, all low platelets. But no matter, here's the two questions. No matter how low the platelets are in hemolytic uremic syndrome and TTP, never answer giving platelets. Next is that even though you have the renal function and the low platelets, the renal function and the low platelets, the closest thing you get to a specific test is the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia fragmented cells. There is a test for TTP. This is hard now, a decreased level of ADOMPS13. ADOMPS13 is the missing enzyme in TTP. That's the stuff that breaks down von Willebrand's factor, ADOMPS13. When you're missing ADOMPS13, the platelets clump out, they crunch up your platelets, crunch up your red cells, the platelets clump out, it destroys your red cells, the platelets clump out, destroys your red cells. No matter how low the platelets are, don't say give platelets say give plasma phoresis. Last one for this section, good pastures, nothing has changed, not one word, good pastures is lung and renal, lung and renal, lung and renal, lung and renal, and anti-basement membrane antibodies, anti-basement membrane antibodies, and the treatment was plasma phoresis and steroids 30 years ago, and the treatment is plasma phoresis and steroids now. The biopsy showed linear deposits 30 years ago, and it shows linear deposits now. Anti-basement membrane antibodies, a very good specific blood test. Plasma phoresis and steroids, look for linear deposits. Good pastures, lung and renal, basement membrane antibodies, and it's easy, and you have survived glomerular disease. You have survived, do you notice which of these give you eosinophils? Which of them give you eosinophils in the urine? None of them. Which of these are caused by toxins, by drugs? Which of these is induced by drugs? None of them. Which of these can cause nephrotic syndrome? All of them. If it's severe enough to damage the glomerulus, enough to damage the glomerulus, then they change from being glomerulonephritis, mostly characterized by red cell, small protein, red cell, red cell cast, a small amount of protein, red cell, red cell cast, a small amount of protein, and they can get nephrotic syndrome. Biopsy is the most accurate test for pretty much all of them. We don't have to do it in everybody, but it's the most accurate. Most accurate in biopsy is in biopsy, good pastures, biopsy. Biopsy in good pastures, that's how you see the linear deposits. Which of them from toxins? None of them. Which of these can cause nephrotic? All of them. So we have principles here, don't we? We do. Now besides the red cells and red cell casts and the protein, besides the fact that you could get nephrotic syndrome with all of them, what's special about the red cells here? What's special? What's unique? The answer is, they're dysmorphic, dysmorphic red cells, dysmorphic. That means that they have funny shapes, dysmorphic red cells, dysmorphic red cells, funny shape as they squeeze through the glomeruli, they get misshapen. 